Okay, let's begin our journey into motor control. Motor control is really fun. I don't know why I find it fun, but I find it really fun. So we're going to spend um, the next five lectures or so on on motor on the motor hierarchy, the motor uh, control system, which in, consists of the motor hierarchy plus two modulatory systems, and and I've diagrammed this in this cartoon here, which shows in black. It shows the hierarchy, which uh, uh, term the ultimate goal is to move muscle, and the only way to move muscle is through motor neurons. Control, but the motor neurons are dumb. They are just going to do what they're told. So they have to get some input. They have to get some input from somebody else. And a major place that they're going to get input from is uh, local inner neurons that are going to organize very simple, uh, uh, simple movements. Um, and then there are more complicated movements that are uh, created by what's called central pattern generators. And this is a very important concept that we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time on. Um, and the central pattern generators are, are they're really good at making a, a, a integrated complex mo movement, but not for any particular reason. So these are complex movements, but they have no reason for happening. And they, they in fact, don't even initiate. So it takes motor control centers to initiate these movements through the central pattern generators. And the motor control centers are, there are motor control centers both in the brainstem and in the cortex. What's really special about cortical motor control centers, including motor cortex, somatomotor cortex, is that actions that occur up, uh, as a result of activity here are imbued with, with, with meaning. So movement plus meaning is an action. So actions occur, they don't occur, what, what in, in the parlance that I'm going to use, what comes out of the spinal cord is a movement, but what comes out from the neocortex through this hierarchy is an action. Now the actions don't look typical unless there are two, uh, the participation, uh, unless you have the participation of two modulatory loops. One modulatory loop comes from the cerebellum. And the cerebellum can be thought of as the conductor. There, you have lots of different movements. Uh, you have lots of different instruments. You have to know when the, the strings are going to um, die down and the percussion is going to ramp up. Uh, and to do that, it's not that the string players talk directly to the percussion players. They all look at the, they all look at the conductor, and the conductor organizes these different groups. Well, the same thing is true for the cerebellum. The cerebellum is going to organize different, uh, different muscle groups and make sure that movements, that if I want to point to my finger, that I don't overshoot my finger and I don't undershoot my finger. I don't want to end here. I don't want to end there. I don't want to end to the left or to the right. I want to go p spot on, even if I perhaps haven't even ever made that movement before. If there's a movement to, to one part of the, of the world I've never done before, I still want it to be spot on the first time I do it. And I use the cerebellum to predict what it's going to take to make a movement spot on the first time I do it. Now, the, the cerebellum is going to be sensitive to changing conditions, and so it's going to have, it has a huge learning component um, across a short time scale. And we'll talk a lot more about that when we talk about the cerebellum. The basal ganglia, as we mentioned before, is involved in action selection. What action? Of the many actions that, w that one could make right now, what action should one make? Should one smile or frown? Should one look to the left or look to the right? That is going to be the output of the basal ganglia. And moreover, the basal ganglia is also going to be very uh, useful in chaining together sequential uh, complex movements. So chaining together the movements that it takes to look at somebody's face, to move your eyes across somebody's face and identify who they are. This is, these are things that are going to be organized um, by both the cerebellum and the basal ganglia. And these two m major modulatory structures work together. So 
what this means is that there can be a deficit in part of this uh, in, in part of this pathway that can affect some types of movement and not other types of movement. Before we take a look at, at, at what that looks like, we're going to um, diagram, we're going to put on the board the different types of movements that there are. All right, so, um, and we're going to divide them into four big categories, passive movement, reflexive movement, uh, stereotyped, and self-generated. So we'll go through these and we'll divide up the self-generated in a minute. So passive movement simply means, is it, is it easy or hard for me to, to move, to, for somebody else to move somebody's uh, limb, say? And the, the limb can be loose, it can be floppy, the limb can, be, uh, can have some resistance. And there are different uh, disorders that, that uh, um, make either of those uh, situations. So essentially, a, a, a floppy tone, little resistance, makes one think of the cerebellum, whereas um, a, a, a rigidity or a, um, uh, what's called a cogwheel rigidity is a specific example where it's difficult to passively move somebody else's arm. And that's a sign of basal ganglia uh, dysfunction. All right, so reflexes. Reflexes, we're going to go into the nitty gritty of uh, some of the basic reflexes because this is part of the neurological exam. This is part of determining the basic uh, health or status of the nervous system of a person. And one of the reflexes that you all know about is the knee jerk reflex, which is one, one of the stretch, it's a stretch reflex. There are stretch reflexes, a lot of different stretch reflexes. That's one. It's a particularly easy one to get. And a person can be, uh, can lose reflexes, have no reflexes. That would be a reflexia. They can have um, a, a deficit, so hyporeflexia. And they can have a briskness, which is hyperreflexia. So a briskness of, uh, of, of reflex. That means that the reflex not only happens, but it happens very quickly and is very exaggerated. And these are, tend to be uh, areflexia and hyperreflexia tend to occur when there is interruption of either the motor neuron the, the nerve going out to the muscle, the neuromuscular junction, or the muscle. So you can't really move if you don't have that final common pathway working well. Hyperreflexia, on the other hand, is a, uh, is a common result of damage to the corticospinal tract. All right, and we'll look at that because that's very clinically important, as you may imagine. Stereotype movements. These are the movements such as chewing, walking, uh, standing, and a lot of other movements. And the, uh, the way that these are encoded is through a central pattern generator, and that's what we're going to look at a lot. Um, and you can have deficits in, in any of these uh, uh, types of movements if the central pattern generator itself is, is damaged. When we get to self-generated movements, there are, there are what we're going uh, we're going to divide it into two groups. One is, it, 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 we get a little philosophical here. So volitional, deliberate, something in that category. This is something that's explicitly uh, made. This is a movement that is explicitly generated. And the, and the uh, poster child for this is Simon Says. Simon Says, put your hand on your, on your, uh, on your put your hand on your head. That's a volitional, deliberate movement. In contrast, there are emotional movements. That's what happens when you hear a joke and you laugh. Okay. So now let's see uh, two patients. We're going to look at two patients where this works. And and I'm sorry, it's actually the reverse. <laughs> This works and this doesn't. All right. So let's go back over to the slides. 
So in this situation, here's a person who um, is being asked to smile. And you see that uh, she has half a smile. But this side of the, of the face is not working. And then she, she's told a funny joke. And now look at her smile. OK? So that is the difference between a volitional and an emotional movement. Now, could this person have a Bell's palsy? Could this person have a seventh nerve, a seventh cranial nerve deficit? Well, no. And, and this person who has a context-specific deficit, that is always going to be a central problem. It's never going to be a peripheral problem. And we're going to hammer on the control of facial expressions because it's very, very important to people and it's very important for, for diagnosis. OK. Another example of this is shown here. Um, here is an individual at rest. This is a little more subtle if we can zoom in. Here is a person at rest, and they, they look fine. Now here is where they've been asked to do a smile, and you can see that there's a smile on this side, but much less on, on the right side of her face. However, when she's either laughing or annoyed, by something that is said, so this is an emotional reaction, it's perfectly fine. So there are two points to be made here. First is that, that the, the uh, restriction of, of her deficit to volitional movements um, and the, the, the appearance of her resting face as normal would suggest that the resting face is an emotional face. It's not a volitional face in the, in the way of Simon Says. OK? You're not deliberately, consciously putting on your face at every moment in time. It is an outflow of your emotional state. The second thing to notice is take a look at, up here at the volitional uh, uh, smile. So what you can see is that the mouth goes up on the left, it doesn't go up on the right. But look at the, the forehead. So the forehead on the right is, is contracting. And this is a, a big difference between uh, the peripheral control and the central control of facial expressions. And we're going to come back to this. What, what you're going to learn is that the control of the top half of the face is bilateral and is basically never damaged by central lesions, whereas the control of the lower half of the face is the thing that gets damaged because it's only provided contralaterally. We're going to go through that about five different ways because it's something that you have to learn. Great. So in the next um, video, what we're going to do is we're going to explore the different types of muscle fibers. <laughs>